chance to fall into a safety net. But when adversity or hardship presents itself, it beats the alternative. Since 1943, the Jockey Club Safety Net Foundation has been serving those individuals and families in need across every facet of the thoroughbred industry. Help us continue to be the safety net and catch those most in need. Visit tjcfoundation.org to learn more. At the heart of really what we come to do well is understand our clients. Understanding what the needs of the family are. Help them make some decisions. Preparing the next generation for what's to come. Being on a first name basis, getting to know their stories. Working through their questions, their concerns, and, and figuring out the solution that's best. They trust us enough to come in and help them solve that. You really feel at the end of the day when you add value, there's a great sense of accomplishment and reward. Henry David Thoreau once said, it's not what you look at that matters, it's what you see. In managing wealth, there's an awful lot to look at. Taxes and trusts, family meetings and bonds, and everything in between. It's why we rely on those who know each of these fields so deeply that they can see where others are merely looking, who can focus on what's best for clients over generations. After all, that's what expertise is. On behalf of Loan Review, I'd like to welcome everyone to the 2021 Virtual Thoroughbred Owner Conference. I'm Gary Falter with the Jockey Club. I'm very pleased to have those of you who are with us for the first time, and many of you who are joining us for the second time in this series of 10 panels. So welcome to everyone. Our topic today is finding your thoroughbred athletes. The panel discussion will last about 50 minutes, followed by Q&A for another 20 to 25 minutes. So please keep in mind, if you have a question for the panelists at the bottom of your Zoom screen is a Q&A button that you can click on to submit your questions. And we'll try to get to as many questions as we can at the end of the discussion. The host and organizers for the Virtual Owner Conference Series are the Jockey Club and the Thoroughbred Owners and Breeders Association. And I'll also like to recognize all of our sponsors, starting with the presenting sponsors, Bessemer Trust, Dean Dorton Equine, Stolkeen and Ogden, and Stone Street Farm. The support of all the sponsors makes this event possible. So if you get an opportunity this year, be sure to thank the sponsors for their support of thoroughbred ownership and making it possible to offer this year's conference at no charge to you. We hope you enjoyed today's panel and you'll return next month when we talk about partnerships and racing syndicates. The moderator for today's panel is Mike Penna from the Horse Racing Radio Network. Thank you, Mike, for being with us, and please take it from here. Yeah, thanks, Gary. Appreciate it. Uh, I have the distinction of being part of every single OwnerView conference since the very beginning, and it's always a delight to have everybody with us and to hopefully shed some light on some topics that maybe you're not as familiar with and, and kind of look at things a little bit differently. Uh, than you have in the past. So looking forward to, to this discussion here today and really excited to be part of it. If you're not familiar with me and what I do with Horse Racing Radio Network, 
you can visit our website, which is horseracingradio.net and learn all about it. I won't bore you with the details here. We've got more important things to get to. So let's go ahead and get started. And I want to introduce each of our panelists. The first is uh, Terry Finley of West Point Thoroughbreds. Terry, welcome. So great to be with you, Mike, and uh, good to be back as well. So I, yeah. I, uh, I've been in the business about 30 years in on the partnership business. And of course, over that time, we've seen a lot of partnerships and, and, and uh, different forms of ownership and uh, excited to participate uh, today with everybody else. Yeah, really excited to have you on board. Uh, trainer Kenny McPeak is with us as well. You probably know him because you've seen him in the winter circle plenty of times at the racetracks. Kenny, welcome. Thanks for having me, Mike. Um, hopefully we can shed some light to a lot of people about our, about our sport and how much we all love it. And uh, looking forward to answering some cool questions. And then we turn our attention to the only lady on our panel today. That is Gail Van Leer. She does a fantastic job on the blood sock side of things. Gail, welcome to the to the panel. Good morning. I think I'm the only one here from the West Coast. Um, mm. And it's a beautiful day in Del Mar, as you can see behind me, although that was the picture taken over Breeders' Cup. So I look forward to uh, speaking on this wonderful topic. And uh, seeing what we can do to enlighten you on, on how you can acquire your racehorse. And coming at it from the veterinary side of things is Dr. Jeffrey Burke. Jeff, appreciate it. Oh, thanks a lot for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, excited to hear your side of things as well. So again, we're gonna cover a lot of ground and we're gonna talk about a lot of different aspects to selecting your thoroughbred athlete. There are a, a host of ways that you can get involved in this sport. You can purchase a race ready two-year-old in training. You can go to a yearling sale and purchase a yearling or a weanling. If you're really ambitious, you can go claim a horse at a racetrack and continue running that horse anywhere you would like. Or if you are exceptionally patient and maybe even a little bit ambitious, you can breed your own horses, raise them, and eventually go ahead and and run them and, and see your kids grow up and, and do great things on the racetrack. So a lot of ways to get involved. Again, we're gonna talk about all of that for you. A quick reminder, when we get to the end of our discussion here today, we will open it up to your questions as Gary mentioned. Please keep your questions as short and concise as possible so we can get to as many questions uh, in that time period as we, as we possibly can. So let's go ahead and get started with our first question. And I'm gonna throw this question out to everybody. Um, if you can just start by letting the audience know how you first got your start in the thoroughbred industry. And I guess we'll keep with, well, I'll tell you what, let's go ladies first. How's that? Gail, let's kick it off with you. How'd you get your start? Well, I come from a show horse background. So I could say that I started with my first thoroughbred as a show horse. Um, and to, to really make a long story short, the way I ended up in the thoroughbred business is I sort of had a reputation for being a, a rider that could deal with a tough horse. And somebody flagged me down in the back ring of a horse show one day and asked if I'd be interested in a, a job breaking thoroughbred yearlings. And it was the only few hours of the day that wasn't already occupied and as a starving student, sounded like a great idea. So I basically started as an exercise rider and just moved through the industry from there. I've done pretty much everything except work in front site administration. So I have a you know years long background in a lot of different facets of the industry. Terry, where'd you get your start? So I tell you, Mike, I used to go with my father to Keystone Racetrack, which is right outside of Philadelphia. And I was always fascinated by the, the action, you know, on the front side. And uh, in, in uh, the late seventies, I started to work on at the track and, uh, you know, on a farm in a Colts Neck over at, outside of uh, Monmouth Park. And, you know, I really had it in my blood. And I ended up, I spent eight years in the military and I got out and I, I was programmed to go into the corporate world. And I just said, I got to give this business a try, you know, as a career. And I think I gave myself three or four years and, and I just started at the bottom and put our first uh, partnership together in our uh, 91 and and I just started from there and you know so this year we celebrate our 30th year and you know I'd like to think the best is is in front of us but 
still so excited and unbelievably passionate about the business and about ownership and, and, and certainly about the horse. So, um, I, I, so that's my story in terms of getting started in this great business. Kenny? Um, I'm fortunate to have grown up in Lexington. I uh, went to Keeneland when I was five years old with my grandmother. Uh, my granddad would take me to the races. Um, I learned how to read a pedigree when I was probably 10 or 11. Um, I used to go to the horse sales as a kid and watch broodmares be sold. And I used to love to look how they were made and how they were bred. And so all those details, some kids get into baseball cards and other sports. And this was something that I found fascinating. Um, I did my first horse deal when I was a sophomore in college, trading, trading some brood mares. And, and uh, that was a interesting long story. And then um, graduated from University of Kentucky with a finance degree. And um, I was a classic C plus B minus student and went to work on the racetrack uh, straight off, uh, straight out of my last class. The next morning, went to work on the racetrack as a hot walker. Um, been doing it pretty much ever since, about 35 years training now. Yeah, doing it very, very well. Dr. Burke, how about yourself? How'd you get involved? Well, um, my, my dad's a vet. Uh, he was like a James Harriet type of vet, sort of a mixed animal vet up in Connecticut where I grew up. And there's a lot of farm animals up there at that time. And so uh, it was uh, kind of an unconscious decision just to go to get to veterinary school and I went to vet school at Penn and there's a racetrack not too far from there called Delaware Park. And so in the summertime, I used to go and uh, walk hots and uh, groom and I was completely hooked by that time. So as soon as I graduated from veterinary school, I went to the racetrack uh, actually to Thistledown in Ohio and uh, worked uh, with a very good veterinarian there and then uh, went from there. So uh, yeah, I was completely hooked uh, as soon as I got on the track. All right. Well, the next question is for everybody. As a matter of fact, the next several questions I'm going to ask will be for the entire panel here. Uh, you've all had a lot of success purchasing horses at public auctions. Talk a little bit about the process that you use to identify those horses, whether it be for yourself or for your clients. Uh, Terry, why don't we go ahead and start with you on this one? So, uh, Mike, we're right in the middle of the two-year-old sale season. So, uh, we've already been to two and and there's a big one on uh, the biggest one in April to OBS and, and then everybody comes back uh, to phasic tipton the uh, uh, two or three days after the preakness and I just think it's a great way to buy horses you, you know the yearling sales uh, uh, you know certainly you don't get a shot to see them with a person on their back right but at the two-year-old sales you get a shot to see them actually work a an eighth or, or a, a quarter of a mile. And I think that really gives you an advantage uh, because you're able to see their athleticism on the racetrack. The problem is that, you know, the other people that are in the stands or that are, are, are sitting in front of their computers watching the works are basically seeing the same thing. So I, I think that's a plus and a minus. And, and you know, I just think it's a great way uh, to, to buy into a horse and to buy a horse there are a lot of horses that you know, uh, are, bar, are bought at the two-year-old sales that are going to run at Saratoga and at, at uh, Del Mar, right? So you have action in, what, two or three months after you buy them. So I think that's a, a, a big plus, especially for the people who are, are fixated by the action part of our business. Kenny, what process do you follow to identify those young horses? Um, so, so I already mentioned earlier that, that I've, my background or learning about pedigree when I was young. Um, when I started training, I, I, I'm going to tell you I got a lot of people's rejects. Um, I was training a lot of average to bad horses. Um, we were, you know, I was a learning process because I was young. I was in my 20s. And I had one particular client who had three young horses with me, and they were all, let's just say, exceptionally slow. And um, I told him, I said, look, I, I can't compete at Keeneland and Churchill with these horses. And he said, well, let's just give them away and let's get some more. And, and he said, where do we go? And I said, well, why don't you send me to the yearling sale? So a guy named Roy Monroe, which I think you probably, some people here would know Roy's name, gave me a $6,000 budget and said, go to the October yearling sale. 
So there were about six or 700 horses in the auction and 6,000 um, kind of going like a, to a gunfight with a BB gun, right? Um, and what I did was, is that I took a process of elimination and I looked at every single horse myself. And then I would call all the way down into horses that I felt like were gonna fit my budget. And then I presented the group of horses to, to uh, Roy. And I said, there's 10 horses on this list. And out of the group, I think there's only two that we're gonna be able to afford. I said, but there's one in particular that I think we can get our hands on. So long story short, we bought a filly for 8,500. We went over budget. She ended up being first, second, and third in 15 stakes. She was from the first crop of Lord at War. Um, some of you may know that stallion, an Argentinian horse. And um, it kickstarted me. And today I do it the same way. I, I work the sales as a group. I squeeze. Um, I don't discriminate on budget. I discriminate on confirmation. And um, you try to take the pedigree and you analyze how a horse is made according to how they're bred. And if what I call the, if the pattern's there, then those are the horses that I recommend people buy. And um, I've really, I really prefer yearlings over the two-year-old sale. It takes more time. It's a, uh, it's a process. It's, it's a, uh, certainly it tests some owner's patience, but at the same time, I think you get a lot of value there and it's worked for me for decades. Yeah. What a great story. And it shows too, that you don't have to be a millionaire to, get involved in the sport and to have success, even at a very high level like that. Great story, Kenny. Dr. Burke, how about you? What processes do you go through when you're selecting the horses? Well, one thing that I'm always clear on is that my job is not the same as Gail's or Kenny's or Terry's. You know, I'm, I'm an adjunct. I'm, I'm trying to help them. And I don't, I respect a short list. So if somebody gives me a list of horses to vet, I, I'm working for some very good people and I respect their abilities. And so I don't capriciously wanna take any horses off that list unless, unless it's absolutely necessary. And so my job basically is to know my clients, know what their risk level is, and then look at the horses from a medical standpoint. Uh, three things that I do, I do a good physical examination. I look at their airways with an endoscope and I read their x-rays. And then I assign a level of risk to whatever I see, if there's any abnormalities, whether it's low risk, medium or high risk. And then we have a full discussion with the client so that they understand exactly what the horse has. And they factor that into all the other important considerations that have already been mentioned by Gail and Terry and Kenny in terms of what their, uh, what their criteria are. But I'm, when I, for example, if I wanna walk a horse or at a two-year-old sale jog a horse, I'm not trying to determine whether that horse is an athlete. That's their job. My job is to make sure that it's either not lame and not neurologic. So I'm, I'm just adding information for the final decision, which is not made by me. That makes sense. Gail? Um, I think my approach, and I agree with Kenny, because I come from a, I spent most of my time training, taking second strings and bringing layups back. So you get, you, you understand that the most important thing is sound horses. So um, when you approach a sale, to me, the most important thing is to try to look at as many horses as possible to give yourself a really big inventory. And sometimes you turn up horses that you might've passed over if you just flipped the page because their pedigree wasn't acceptable. So uh, those of you that work the sales with me, I know you see me scurrying around at a fast pace everywhere. and and I'm always on a mission to try to get my inventory and see as many horses as possible for each sale. Cause I think as Kenny explained so well, it gives you a really good way to be able to funnel it down to, to what you can afford in your budget. Um, and I think two yearlings are my favorite because then we can break them ourselves and train them at their own pace versus the two-year-olds, which were on a schedule from the moment they were purchased. All right. Kenny, I'm going to kick it off with you with the next question before we go around the horn. Um, do you ever make private purchases? And if so, talk about that process and the pros and cons involved with a private purchase. You know, not too many. Um, you know, it's difficult to make private purchases for usually at, at that stage of a horse shows in a lot of talent 
then um, then they want an up, you know, a premium for that horse. Um, I really like the auctions a lot better. I have done some private purchases in South America, um, where I believe the market meets when you when you buy South American horses, um, especially because today's currency, you know, the dollar's strong internationally, especially in Brazil and Argentina and Chile. Um, you can what's a lot of money to them might not be a lot of money to us. The problem with those horses is the exportation and the, uh, it takes some time to acclimatize. So usually that's about a six, six month plus or minus, usually plus it takes to bring horses over. So I've really done more, more private deals in South America than I have in North America. And I probably in some ways spoiled my clients because they expect bargains. Um, I'm better off sticking to the yearlings <laughs> and, um, and, and, and that's, that's worked for me. And in some ways it's killed my career. When you buy horses like Curlin for 57 grand, the next guy calls and says, well, I gave Chad Brown 300, but you can only have a hundred. <laughs> and, and I've had that happen. And I'm like, Oh, that's not, that's not good. But anyway, you, you do with what you get and um, the private purchases, they're okay, but they're rare for me. Gal, I could see you smiling. So, Kenny, your Kenny career was... is going just fine, by the way. I, I just want to <laughs> yeah, tell everybody that. Exactly it's just right. fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> bigger budget sometimes. <laughs> Gal, I could see you smiling when Kenny was telling that story. How about uh, your insight into making private purchases? Well, I, 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 I too do not make that many private purchases, but I'm sort of on the other side of things too, because I have owners that I also manage their horses for them once they purchase them. And it, it's like, if you have an impressive maiden winner, I can just hold my phone out and wait for it to ring because somebody's gonna be calling me and they're gonna offer a whole lot of money for that horse. So it, if you don't get your, uh, your notice of, I wanna buy that horse in within five minutes after it crosses the wire, sometimes the deal's already done. So. Um, I myself don't spend a lot of time chasing it because that's sort of a full-time job for people that want to just sit with five TV screens in front of them and watch all the races every day and have their phone on auto dial to certain trainers or owners. So um, it, sometimes I'll, the horses will trade between my own clients for you know various reasons, but mostly it's uh, at the auctions I feel you're getting uh, a better deal when you're competing against other people and it's maybe a more of a fair price. Terry? So, uh, you know, we've really started to pick up the pace of our private purchases. Um, and I think, I, I think one of the reasons is, is that the paradigm uh, of the purchasers uh, and, and of the, the whole private market has really changed, especially in the last, I don't know, eight or 10 years. And, and that paradigm shift is is the fact that people that are are in a position to buy in the horses are are, are looking to buy a majority stake in, in a lot of cases. And so people who finally get a good horse and, and they finally get a horse that's on the verge of being a national and like a, a, a top level horse, they don't want to give the horse up. But uh, the thing is, we find a lot of them want to take some money off the table to get ready to go to the two-year-old sales or to the yearling sales or, or, to, or, or to just be able to put a chunk of money in their bank account to say, you know, I made a profit. Uh, uh, so I think that's really helped people that are looking to buy because, you know, we are, are looking in a lot of those cases with those top horses to buy a leg or a third and, and to not have our silks on, on the horse. So the, uh, the owner or the ownership group, uh, you know, they're comfortable that their situation is, is, is not really gonna change a whole lot. And I think that that paradigm is gonna continue, right? Because there's a lot of interplay between top groups and individuals at the sales or in the sales and, and at the sales. And uh, it, the thing is, we've seen that carry over to the private or uh, the private purchases in the private market. And I think that's going to continue um, because everybody sees, uh, you know, you'd much rather have a third of a really, really good horse than uh, like 100% of an average horse. Yeah, it makes sense. 
Doc, I know you already referenced the fact that you typically serve as more of a, an adjunct in, in these purchasing processes. Uh, so I'm going to, we have plenty of questions planned for you specifically here in just a few minutes. So if you don't mind, I'm going to stick with Terry and Kenny and Gail for the next couple of questions. Um, you know, there's a, a thought process in thoroughbred racing that says if you purchase enough really expensive horses, you're going to have a couple that turn out to be high quality runners. Give an example of the other side. And, and Gail, we'll start with you here. Have you, have you purchased a horse? I'm sure you probably have that you didn't purchase for a lot of money that turned out to be really, really good? Um, I think, and this horse goes a ways back. It's a horse called Runaway Dancer. Um, he was a horse that was a private purchase between clients for 50,000. Um, and I continued to manage him once he moved to my other client. And he was this great turf marathoner. He ended up winning, uh, let's see, he won, Oh, like $839,000 and he had a season. And as long as you took good care of him, he could come back every year and basically run in the same races over and over again. And I, I think that's really important for owners to, to realize too, when you get a good horse, they, there's, on, there's only one or 2% of them out there. So protect them and treat them well and they'll reward you back. He stayed in training until his eight-year-old year. And the clients had so much fun with him. And he's a, he's a hunter jumper now. So it, it's a really, that's one of my favorite stories of just a horse I didn't spend a lot of money for. Um, probably the one that was the best value overall was Hysterical Lady, which I bought with Jerry Hollendorfer. She cost 125, which isn't cheap, but the fact that she earned over two million and then sold for three million as a broodmare prospect, um, she turned out to be quite the bargain for 125,000. Yeah, I would say so. Spectacular yeah. stories. Terry, how about you? So, Mike, I think to I think back to Awesome Gem. So we went out to the Barrett sale yeah, in uh, 2005, and uh, you know, just like Gail, we paid. Uh, what well, we paid 150,000 for them, which isn't a paltry sum, but I, I would imagine there was probably about 20 horses that cost more than him that year. Uh, and we didn't get him to the races until the end of the summer of his uh, three year old year at, at Del Mar. And everybody thought he'd be a pretty solid horse, and he just blossomed. Uh, and, he, and he was third in the, in the classic as, as a four year old at Monmouth Park, and he ran until his what nine-year-old year and he ended up making about 60,000 shy of of our three million and he kept us in the game for a long time so I definitely agree with with Gail when you get those good ones and and you take care of them and they pay you back in spades because every every four or five or six weeks you have a shot to run in in a graded stake you know around the country so I love that time. And every time I think back to awesome Jim, I, I, I get a big old smile on my face. I could listen to these stories all day long. Kenny, what do you got? Least expensive horse. Yeah. You know, I, I, I'm, I got a pretty good list. Um, <laughs> uh, so how to run, I gave 20 grand for, well, Swiss God diver, everybody knows 35,000 take charge lady. I mean, she was 175 and that was a lot for me back then. But what she's done is amazing. Um, Dream Empress. So I think I bought five five Alcibiades winners. I bought all at auction. She's a double do. Was a nice filly. She was um, you know, Rosalind. She was seventy. It's not what you pay. Um, one of the best horses that I ever trained that that we lost to fractured cannonbone was Ten City. Ten City was a complete freak of nature. Um, I bought Einstein for forty five thousand in Brazil. So I love doing that. I think that's a bigger challenge. But I will say on, on the other side of all that, I always say buying horses is a rule of five. And, and if you're buying horses, and I assume a lot of people that are watching this are interested in that, one can't run, one <laughs> refuses to run, <laughs> one gets hurt. One's a useful little horse that you have some fun with. And one's a nice horse or a very nice horse that helps you forget these four. You're looking for him. 
<laughs> and the truth is, it's more like one in 10 or 12. <laughs> one in 10. Uh, but I'm in sales. So <laughs> anyway, but um, it's a very difficult game. It's very humbling. You know, like right now, we, we've got some really good horses in the barn, but we've also got some average horses. I, I sold a group of horses down in Florida before I came north to a lot of the local guys down there. And I think the average price was maybe 10 grand. And, um, but we like to let them stay in the circuits and continue to race at the level that they belong, that they belong, that they belong. And for every Swiss skydiver and simply ravishing, and, and there, there's a list of horses that, that don't make uh, the, the headlines, but they're also, we like to buy horses that are good solid runners that win at different levels and, and that people continue to have fun with, even if they're not grade one winners. Do you take into account who bred and raised the horse when you're making your purchasing decisions? No, uh, no, not at all. I, 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 I simply go on the physicals and, you know, you, you, you lean on veterinarians like Jeff to tell me what can I, what can I accept and what can I accept? Um, I, I bought, I bought a horse with six OCDs in his front legs one time and turned him out for nine months and forgot about him that, and he came back and the OCDs were gone. Um, we, we fed him right. We, we helped him. We rate, gave him more time to mature. Uh, years later, I bought another horse with an OCD in his, in his ankle the size of a dime. And that horse was curling. And everybody turned him down because he had a, he had a bad ankle. But we gave him time. And obviously, Helen and, and Steve Asmussen got the glory out of that. But I was right in the trenches on all that time that he got. And, but those kind of things you deal with. I, I don't like horses with OCDs. And for those that don't know what an OCD, OCD, yeah. osteochondrosis, it's a basic lack of density in the joint. Would you say, Doc? Yeah, it's a developmental issue at, at the joint level. Yeah. So, so they don't, to, to simplify, they don't have enough padding in the joint. And when a horse has that, I don't like them in stifles at all. I can deal with them some other places depending on the depth. But those are the big ones. And of course, if confirmationally, a horse isn't made right. Um, it, it doesn't matter where it's raised. It, it needs to be made right. And I obsess about that. Terry, Gal, do either of you take that into account when you're making a purchase? Um, I'll say I do sometimes. It's really, it's like one of the pieces of the puzzle. It's an extra bonus. I like to be able to do that. But sometimes to fit a horse in your price range, it, you, you have to take, just go ahead and take the horse as it is. I think more importantly is the consigner too. You need to be able to trust your consigner and get good information from your consigner. Uh, I think it, it is very important when you're purchasing these, particularly the two-year-olds. You really need to have a consigner that you can trust and have faith in. Um, by the time they're two-year-olds, they might have changed hands two or three times already. So where they were actually raised and bred isn't as important as um, buying weanlings, for instance. I do like to buy weanlings because of dealing with the large foal crops when I was at Golden Eagle. Um, when you look at 150 foals and watch them grow every single year, I, I, I'm game. I'll buy weanlings up versus a lot of people won't. Terry? Yeah, so, you know, I think about the two-year-old sales and, and that's probably where the consigner comes in uh, and, and it plays the biggest part, right? Because they've had the horse since the previous fall. And so what we'll do is we'll ask the same questions uh, at, at a different points of the week uh, leading up to the sales. And, and the best answers are the same answers, right? Because sometimes you don't necessarily get the same answer because somebody's talking to a bunch of different uh, prospective buyer. But um, you know, I think it is important, you know, obviously the sellers and the consigners are, are trying to get the most money for uh, their horses on the day that they go through the ring, right? The really good people are the ones that, that are able to balance, right? Getting the maximum price, but also leaving something on the bone, as we say, so, so that the, the buyer and the end user can go to the racetrack and, and have a, an inherent you know, chance to be successful. So when you've identified people who you'll have that balance and are, are, are taking care of 
uh, both sides of that equation, right? They're the people that you want to focus on and, and that you want to buy a good portion of your horses from. Terry, I'm going to stick with you for this next question. We'll kick it off with you. Then we'll hear from Kenny and from Gail. There are so many tools available to buyers when they're trying to select a horse. You've got the sale catalog, number one. You've got the blood horse auction edge. Um, from equine line, you have the sales catalog app as well. What tools do, do each of you use? And again, starting with Terry, what tools do you use when you're selecting a horse? Yeah, well, the auction edge that, that is as you mentioned, Mike, put out by the Blood Horse is a very, very good tool to get a baseline of, of where you're at. You know, you think about the pedigree page. Uh, the pedigree page is, is, you know, really a selling tool. So out of the three entities that we're dealing with, we're dealing with the sales company, we're dealing with the consigner and, and the owner, and we're dealing with the prospective buyer. So think about that. That catalog page uh, really is serving the purpose of the first two. Um, and, and the third, uh, you know, we're not, the pedigree page is not against us, but when you bring in the, uh, the buyer's guide, you really get a good sense and, and a good framework of, of the quality of the pedigree. And I think we have a picture or a slide of the, uh, uh, of the buyer's guide or if, if not, we will today. So uh, that's a pedigree page from a catalog. Um, but when you buy the buyer's guide, right, you have a chance to look at the uh, two things in particular that we look for is that the price of the of the the other the progeny of, of the mayor and the prices that they've garnered at other sales in the past. And I, I, so that's very important, right? You might see a, a, a stakes winner on the page, but the stakes winner is up at Thistle Downs. Uh, I think back to Jeff starting or some other minor track where you're really looking for, for top quality. And so I'd, I'd much rather have uh, like a good allowance race or, or uh, you know, uh, like a winner at Saratoga, as opposed to a stakes winner up at Thistle. And, and, and so that's one thing. And the other thing that I think has really been advantageous are the sheet numbers and the, uh, and the Jerry Brown numbers of, uh, you know, the mayor. Like, you know, I think about the, the dam of Authentic, right? She was trained by uh, Billy Ma and she was a rocket ship. She, I remember her first race. I said, that's a, a, a two-year-old filly really destined to do something. And, and she got hurt, but she had a huge sheet number. Um, I'm just sorry that I missed her at, at the, the yearling sales. And, and, and that crew uh, that put together a lot of money, what they paid 460 for them. But they're the kind of edges that I think a tool like the buyer guides affords us as end users at the sales. Gail, are there certain tools that you use? Well, a, a moment ago, the catalog app came up on the screen. Uh, I, I stopped using the paper catalogs in 2012 and have never looked back. The Jockey Club has done a great job with this catalog app. I try to get all my clients to uh, leave their paper books behind and follow me along with, with this. It, it gives you so many more options and for me, who works with the sales alone, I don't use shortlisters. It keeps me tremendously organized and, and have the ability to, again, get out there in the field and look at as many horses as possible. And I can really go fast with this and I can keep good notes. It has uh, the ability to look back. If I'm at a two-year-old sale and I happen to have seen this horse at a, a previous sale, my yearling notes and my weanling notes would come up by simply clicking a button within the app, which is a huge asset. Um, I also use the, the buyer's guide, like Terry said, it's an invaluable source of information. The uh, equine line produce record subscription, again, it's updated practically when the horses cross the finish line is a great asset. And the global stallions as well is hugely helpful. And for me, all of those I can have on my iPad and I do not have to carry any paper books around with me. So those are the tools that I use. 
All right, Kenny, in the interest of time, we are going to have to skip you and move on to Dr. Burke here in a minute. So uh, if you want to know what Kenny McPeak uses, stop him at the racetrack, see him in the winner's circle and say, hey, how'd you select that horse? <laughs> Paper book. <laughs> he's old school. <laughs> he's my instinct, really. <laughs> all right, wonderful. All right, well, Dr. Burke has been waiting patiently. Well, we've talked about all these other topics. We'll go ahead and get to Dr. Burke to talk about the veterinarian's role in helping to select your thoroughbred athlete. But before we do, let's have a word for the sponsor of today's panel, the New York Racing Association. The New York Racing Association is a proud partner of the Jockey Club and supporting horsemen nationwide. Naira is committed to supporting owners and horsemen with a first-class experience across Saratoga Racecourse, Belmont Park, and Aqueduct Racetrack. With the safest track conditions in the country, newly renovated dormitories at Belmont Park, and a continued effort to increase purses, discover all the benefits of racing in New York at Naira.com. All right, Doc, let's go ahead and get started. Uh, okay. You have been so patient sitting through all of the other questions. So explain the role of a veterinarian and uh, the purpose of what is known as a repository. Okay, so just really quickly, I alluded, alluded to it already, but the, the role of a vet at the sales is basically threefold. And I think all three things are important. Uh, a good physical examination of the horse, uh, examination of the horse's throat, and then looking at the x-rays that are lodged in the repository. So physical exam briefly is, uh, you know, looking at the horse's eyes, listening to its heart. If it's a colt, making sure it has two testicles. Uh, a good uh, physical, a uh, good manual examination of the limbs, making sure there's no heat, filling, flexions are good. Um, we usually palpate the belly for a scar in case the horse has had colic surgery. Uh, and when I walk or trot the horse, it's to see whether they're lame or potentially neurologic, which there's always one or two um, that go undetected. Um, also, we look for behavioral issues. Um, I know that a lot of the people in the audience may not be familiar with it, but little things like if a horse has a mirror in its stall, uh, you know, or if there's a groom holding the horse constantly because if they let it go, they can't catch it. You know, just, just how the horse is acting because, you know, uh, and the, of course, Terry, Gale, and Kenny know this better than anybody, but uh, there's a great mental and uh, component that goes along with a good horse and you really love it. And, and realizing that horses come into sale, it's a foreign environment. They don't all handle it the same. Some of them haven't been handled or, or treated well or handled well, I should say. Um, so just trying to pay attention to the individual and then in, uh, if there is a throat video that's of acceptable quality in the repository, we'll look at that. Uh, otherwise I will scope the horse myself while I'm with it. And, uh, we'll have a, uh, a couple of examples of what I'm looking at on the throat on video here in, in a minute. And then, uh, going into the repository, um, looking at the the joints of the horse. So basically there's 36 prescribed views of each horse's joints, including the front and hind fetlocks, knees, stifles, and hocks. And um, so we review those and uh, I'm basically recording any, what I would say either an abnormality or something unusual, and then trying to assign a level of risk to it. The horses have things and as Gail pointed out so importantly, <laughs> There's just not, you know, when you're looking at trying to find the best horses, um, they're, they're in the minority. And so you can't discount a horse for a veterinary issue unless it, uh, you factored it in and it becomes a high risk issue. Other than that, I think that the, the people that are good at buying horses and finding the athletes are the ones that understand that they have to live with some veterinary findings. And when you factor it into the whole, which they do, they look at the pedigree, they look at the individual, how that horse moves, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, it's a piece of the puzzle. And so all I, everything that I do is just one piece of a very large puzzle. So I try not to overemphasize veterinary findings and I have different clients with different purposes. So some people are buying to resell they maybe have to be a little pickier in terms of what they can accept. Other people are buying to race and they have a very good risk tolerance. Those are the people that can really, you know, handle a lot and, and have a better chance of buying a good horse. 
So uh, in the repository, as I mentioned, we're just, we're just looking at uh, findings uh, on the bones. And I have, I have some examples of that as well, just a couple, just to show people what it is that we're looking at. If there are people that aren't familiar with a repository, you mentioned that word several times. Talk yeah. about the repository okay. and how it is used. So, so what that is, basically um, every sales company now has a, a room where they have a bunch of viewing screens for veterinarians to look at x-rays. And so the consigner, their responsibility is to bring the x-rays or, or to send them electronically to the server at the sales company. So all of those images are lodged in the server. And so if I get a list uh, that includes hip number three, um, I can sit down at my screen, I've got a username, password, pull the horse's x-rays up and view them and then write a report on that. So it's basically just a room where the veterinarians can sit down. We can actually view the x-rays remotely. So I might be sitting up at midnight in my hotel room at a sale reading x-rays. So the repository is no longer just a room. It's an online thing that we can access with our own computers. All right, thanks. Earlier, Kenny touched on joints and some potential joint issues. Could you show us a couple images of joint issues that could become problematic? Absolutely. Um, I think they should be coming up. Uh, the first one should, that, that's, that's an ankle. That's actually a hind ankle on a horse. And what I've done, uh, I wanna just uh, sort of differentiate between ages of horses. Where that arrow is, you can see that little uh, white uh, speck there in the front, that's the front of the ankle, and that's a chip fracture, that's off of P1. And this happens to be a yearling, uh, so uh, it's not currently causing a problem for the horse, but that horse is going to be resold, and so typically that horse will get surgery to remove that. That same finding can be seen in a two-year-old in training or a racehorse, and uh, depending on whether the finding is clinical or not and the desire of the owner, it may or may not be surgically removed. But uh, the age of the horse plays a lot into this discussion and what the intended use is and how the horse is clinically. If that horse was a racehorse and it had filling in the ankle and it was a little hot or if the horse was a little bit lame, uh, most certainly that, would, that little fragment would be removed and that particular surgery would have an excellent prognosis. So that horse would be likely on the shelf for a little while to recover from surgery and then back at racing at probably 100% of its ability. Great. Um, there's an, um, and th this, is a, this is another radiograph and this is also from a repository. This is a stifle. And Kenny had mentioned um, his concerns about stifle lesions and where that arrow is, there's a little divot. That's, that bone is called the femur. We, we have the same bone. Uh, this is the horse's stifle. For us, for humans, it's a knee. But that area of that bone of the femur is called the, the medial condyle. And that's an area where we can see some, uh, someone referred to OCDs, basically developmental lesions. And I picked this particular one because there's a little sort of a divot there. And above it, you can kind of see how it's brighter white. That's sclerosis. And so that's an active process that's going on. And that bone is trying to decide whether it's going to turn into a bone cyst or it's going to heal. So we, that's, so therefore you'd say, well, at a sale, there's some risk involved there because we don't know what's going to happen. We need about 60 days to revisit that x-ray, take new x-rays and see which direction it's going. So you have developmental lesions like this and you have traumatic ones like bone chips from, from activity. I know back at the barns, most consigners will have vet reports to show prospective buyers the results and the scopes and the x-rays and those things. Talk about the use of those reports and, and how they may or may not help a prospective buyer. Um, I think I can speak pretty specifically about that because we've, we've had concerns over the years and it's not really anybody's fault, but um, there's no prescribed manner when these reports are made. The reason that people get frustrated with differing veterinary opinions is first of all, veterinarians have different ex levels of experience with types of horses. Some of them may have practiced on the track, never been around young horses or vice versa. And so there's quite a difference in terms of the perceived significance on the part of the veterinarian. So people are gonna write down what they think is important. Uh, if one veterinarian is writing down the things that they think are important just for racing, 
and another vet is putting every little bump and blemish, you're going to have two different, completely different reports, and it's going to be frustrating trying to navigate your way through that. And it's not to say which is right or wrong, but um, we actually did a study back in 2010. Myself, I put together a group of 10 different veterinarians from completely different practices, so none of us were affiliated. And we went through our findings from the Keeneland September sale, um, and we were looking at horses where we had expressed some concern on our own reports about a finding. And then Keeneland was kind enough to give us the consigners report. We stapled them together and we sat down on Friday afternoons and Saturdays at Keeneland, looking at the x-rays and deciding whether we, if, if the reports differed, who was right. We're, and we'd sit in a room with a bunch of other vets and they might say, gee, Jeff, I think you might've been a little too hard on that one. I, we agree with the consigner, but we went through these horses, 392 of them. And when it was all done, our objective was to say, are these reports accurate or are they not accurate? And in 48% of the cases, the, the report that was being shown was not really representative of the horse. And that was the 10 of us that decided that. So I think um, that's to say it's like a coin flip. And to me, then it's not appropriate to be looking at those reports to make major decisions on. Um, I think it's for the people that are watching, I'm assuming that you're interested in, in buying horses or you wouldn't be watching this, uh, this conference. And that being the case, I think the take home point is to find somebody that you think is competent and trustworthy to do that work for you. And um, I think people get in trouble when they rely on those reports too much. Yeah, it makes sense. So earlier you mentioned that you had some examples of potential throat issues, a, a normal throat, an abnormal mm -hmm. throat, um, and the scope and, and the process that's involved there. Could you discuss that a little bit more, Doc? Yeah, sure. I mean, basically what we're doing, whether we're viewing a video in the repository of a throat or whether we're actually looking at the throat uh, ourselves with our own equipment, it's basically the same exam. And what we're, what we're trying to do, uh, every athlete needs to get a certain amount of air. And the more air you get, the better, the better your, your athletic function will be. And so we're just trying to make sure that there's no abnormalities that would be significant enough to preclude the horse from being an athlete or just assigning a level of risk. Um, Terry brought up a horse named Awesome Gem, and I was involved in that horse from day one because I remember how it scoped as a yearling at Saratoga and then going through uh, it's the process to take it to the two-year-old sale. And as ironically, my brother, who at the time was a racetrack vet in California at Hollywood Park, uh, was taking care of the horse on the other end when he was seven years old. Uh, and so this, interestingly, the first video that we have when, when it comes up will show the type of throat that that was, which is um, it, a fair bit of asymmetry, but still able to function normally. So. Um, if you just watch this, th watch this, and the, th the throat opening is like a door, and you see the arches of the door on top, each side, and what you're looking at is just trying to see if the sides move together or if they move separately. Ideally, they, li they like to be very symmetric, but you can see on your right where the arrow is, that horse is right there. He's able to open fully and hold, which makes it a normal throat. But when the horse is functioning, you could see that there's some difference besides between how the one side works versus the other. That's what we're looking at. And we have a grading system for that. So this would be a 2B throat, meaning it, it's moderately asymmetric, but fully abducts and holds. So it's a, that's a normal throat, but that's just to give you a taste of what it is that we're trying to look at when we look at the throats. Um, All right. There's another video coming up. And again, it's just to kind of give you a taste of what, what it looks like in there when we're scoping the horse. And uh, this, you'll see when this video comes up that there's a slipper-like structure at the bottom of the screen. And what that is, that's an epiglottis that's been entrapped. In other words, there's a piece of tissue like a slipper that has slipped around that normal epiglottis structure at the bottom. And um, that's, that horse would potentially require surgery to relieve that. It's, it's probably the only throat surgery that has an excellent prognosis. And um, actually this is, this is the very thing that Omaha Beach had was an entrapped epiglottis because I know everybody will probably know that horse. So those are the, that's just to give you an example of the types of things that we're looking for when we're scoping horses. 
right. awful lot to it. Thanks, Doc. Appreciate that. Uh, I'm going to go back to the to the entire panel here for one more question. In just a few minutes, we'll open it up to questions and answers from our audience. So we'll take those. And again, if you could please keep them as short and concise as possible, we'll try to get to as many as we can as time allows. Um, many owners, and we haven't touched on this a lot throughout the panel discussion, many owners will tend to breed, opt to breed their own horses as opposed to going and buying them at, at a yearling sale or a two-year-old in training sale. What are some of the advantages and maybe even potential disadvantages that an owner would face when they breed horses to race? Terry? Well, I, I think one of the biggest things is that you have a lot longer time to dream and to and the dream that that, that one or, or the group of horses is going to turn out to be the uh, the kind of horse or or the kind of group that you you think they are. Uh, obviously, you take what God gives you uh, after they hit the ground, and uh, right. So that is, in and of itself, I, I, there's a risk assigned to that. But the other other thing is, is that you're able to put them into your own program, right? So they're not going to be in what three or four different sets of 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 a hands before they actually get to the racetrack. And I, I think that's a distinct advantage in the right program, uh, at the ability to control the environment and the training and the people who are involved with the, uh, the horse that you bred. So I would think they would be the biggest aspects and the biggest advantages uh, to breeding your own horses. Gail, Kenny, what would you like to add to those comments? You know, people that breed horses, um, should be given a medal in this sport. I mean, when, when a grade one, when a grade one winner comes out, you should actually send a check to the guy that bred that or the, the people that bred that horse. Um, it's an amazingly difficult side of it. it th there's a huge amount of um, just positive feeling when you do do, when you do breed a great horse, a Kentucky Derby winner or a Breeders' Cup winner. Um, what people don't realize is, is the math. So if you own a broodmare, around 60% of the time, you're gonna get a live racing foal. And then when you're buying yearlings, you, you know what you're looking at. When you're buying two-year-olds, you obviously get plenty of time to analyze that horse. When you're breeding horses, when that foal drops, you get what you get. And then you have to go through another year, two years, if you're gonna race that horse yourself, three before you get the results. So. So people that breed and race horses are amazing people. Um, and, and, and the time and energy that they put into that is, um, it's not properly rewarded sometimes, but, um, but it is very difficult. And I've, I've always told my clients, look, if you're gonna breed horses, breed out of a grade one, grade two, grade three stakes mare. Don't, don't breed the average mare that couldn't make the races, a mare that couldn't win, stick to quality, quality, quality. And, and, and if you look at the evolution of the thoroughbred, um, if you analyze the history of the thoroughbred, it really is the most analyzed animal in the history of mankind because kings and queens have been doing this for 400 years and maybe a, a lot of centuries even before that. So, um, so that particular angle is, it's, for me, it's amazingly difficult. Yeah. Oh, you're on mute. Uh, you're muted. Mute. You probably want to unmute your mic there. Okay. I All agree right, with what both, both Terry and Kenny said. And it, it, I have a lot of breeder clients. And so I work with them. And I, just this morning, I had a phone call. I lost a foal. And, 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 and it's, it's, it's very, very difficult. But I, I'll emphasize what Kenny said. Make sure you're going to do this quality mares are the key. You must have a quality mare. Just because you raced the filly and she got hurt, now what do I do with her? Oh, let's breed her. No, don't do that. All right, Gail, let's stay with you for this one final question. And again, we'll open it up to questions from our audience right after this. Um, Gail, talk about the importance of aftercare. That's a term we hear thrown around a lot in our sport these days. Talk about aftercare and, and what you're doing to support aftercare. Well, as I said, I came from a background where I was already doing aftercare. Um, and so I, I 
feel that it's really critically important. I am on the board of the Tranquility Farm, which was one of the original aftercare organizations founded by Gary Bizantz, who is past president of the Toba Group and also very successful owner. So I continue uh, as a, and some of this is person by person and horse by horse. I support our local uh, out here in California on the proverbial volunteer, anything that they need for the horse retirement programs in California, I'm always helping out. I personally try to find homes for any horses that my clients need to move on. Uh, and I love going to horse shows and seeing them perform. So I think everybody has to do even one horse at a time, whatever we can do but getting them out into the show horse industry is really, really important. Kenny? Um, I, have a, I have a, well, 20 year old daughter who's a three day eventer and she has a lot of friends and it's not unusual for us to take Colts or, or even fillies off the racetrack. Um, we'll turn them out on my farm in Lexington and we wait and we, let's see, we have girls come by and say, okay, there's five out back, go check them out and pick one out. And um, they, they, they've had a blast with these horses um, to retool them, retrain them. Um, there's a mis mis notion that thoroughbreds are too high strung to have, I guess you could say, be riding horses. I don't believe that at all. I think most thoroughbreds are easy to be around for the most part. Um, and you'll get a rare exception. But these kids, uh, they take them. We also try to make sure that horses that aren't racing at a high level, we um, give them an opportunity to race at second, third level circuits, what I'd call a B, C, D circuit. It doesn't matter to me if they race them in, in, in uh, Ohio or West Virginia or, you know, uh, Indiana, as long as the horse gets a chance to win some races. And that goes back to the breeder because the breeder wants to see the horse that they produced to win and, and to earn and, and be a, you know, respectable runner. Harry. So I tell you, Mike. You know there are a lot of things that I, I'm uh, really proud of the business and of, of the industry, and I, I, that I'm I'm a part of. I think the one thing I, I'm uh, most proud of is is the progress that we've made as as an industry in the last ten years, uh, taking care of of uh, of our retired racehorses. And you know, I think back uh, the the first meeting uh, of you know, the creation of the Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance, which now is really uh, the bellwether, uh, you know, to take care and, and to authenticate all the different places around the country that are, are doing their part to take care of our retired resources. And I think it just comes down to accountability. You know, we, we're demanding that owners are accountable to their horses and, and the ones that have provided such entertainment and and thrills on the racetrack right we are all accountable to those horses after they're done and, and and they're finished in their careers and i agree with kenny i think people in the horse world outside of the thoroughbred business are really starting to see the value and and, and the adaptability of the thoroughbred racehorse and i think it's i, I think it's a success story that's going to continue to grow and grow and grow. And I'm just proud as hell of the industry overall, uh, you know, about the way we take care of our horses after they finish. Yeah, well said. Doc, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I would just echo what Terry says. Um, we're, uh, I work, I do a lot of work for new vocations here in Lexington. And so I'm out there every week or two going over a half a dozen horses at a time and, you know, doing the diagnostics. I bring my x-ray machine and my ultrasound and you know, kind of comb them over and, and decide, first of all, what their injuries are, what it's going to require for them to heal up, and then, you know, what amount of time, and then how fast we can go back to some low-level training to, to sort of re reassess the horse. You know, when they're, when they're racehorses, they're being assessed for racing talent, but now, um, as somebody said, I mean, these, these are truly the best horses that there are. They are the most athletic, they're brave, and they're the most intelligent, and so, you're finding, whereas years ago, the three-day event crowd sort of gravitated towards the warm bloods. They're going back to thoroughbreds and droves now. It's very uh, uh, new vocations. It's amazing how many horses move through that program. Um, 
also um, I'm the chair currently of the, a, the American Association of Equine Practitioners Racing Committee. And we have a big initiative going on right now, uh, stressing the importance of this and trying to get equine vets around the country to get more involved with some of these aftercare facilities that Terry referred to under the umbrella of Thoroughbred Aftercare Alliance. There are many, many facilities around the country. So we're really seeing the, not just the importance of that and, and owner awareness about the stewardship of these horses so that they're not useless by the time that they are done racing. So uh, yeah, I think it's about one of the things one of the things that we, meaning all of us on this screen, are, are involved in that you can be the most proud of. Yeah, great stuff. All right, well, that's going to wrap up the panel discussion portion uh, of, of this particular conference. We're going to segue into the question and answer segment. Um, while we kind of sort through some of those questions, stay with us and enjoy this from Blood Horse. There's no better way to follow thoroughbred racing, breeding, industry news, and more than with Blood Horse. Blood Horse Magazine, the industry's premier monthly magazine and tablet, with feature stories, in-depth profiles, and analysis, award-winning photojournalism, and the industry's top writers. And the new Blood Horse Plus, available through bloodhorse.com, with weekly multimedia interactive shows, behind-the-scenes videos, daily stakes winner section, monthly equine line credits, and more. Covering thoroughbred racing, breeding, and our sport for more than 100 years. Blood Horse. All right, Gary has been sorting through all the questions, so let's turn it back over to him. Gary? Okay, thanks, Mike, and thanks to all the panelists. Uh, so the way we should do this, Mike, is I'm going to ask the question, and why don't you just uh, propose the question to one of the speakers so we can get to uh, as many questions as we can because there are a bunch here. So um, here's a question. I hear terms confirmation, athlete, and pedigree when choosing a horse. How do you weigh these factors of confirmation versus pedigree? So maybe uh, get somebody to answer that question, Mike. All right. Uh, how about Kenny McPeak? So we, we started to touch on it earlier. I, I use a lot of instinct. Um, if anybody's ever read the book Blink, um, Malcolm Gladwell. And, and, and so in that beginning of that book, within the first couple of chapters, he uses an analogy about experts had seven seconds to look at a piece of art. And then other experts had, I believe, two days. I don't know if I got these right, but the group that had seven seconds got it right more often than the group that had two days. And so I use a lot of instinct. Um, looking at the pedigree, looking at the horse, I believe in aura like energy if a horse has got great energy if they've got spring in their step if they've got a great eye so a lot of that i mean that's something that's hard to teach anybody um you know when you watch horses walk around a shed row and train on the racetrack for decades you start seeing horses that 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 have that that the energy and that 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 shine and you can't hardly explain it other than some people can see it and some can't so um and I'm obsessive about the hind leg when Doc's showing the stifle earlier. If the whole, there, there's the old saying, no foot, no horse. I disagree. No hind leg, no horse. Because the hind leg is the motor. And, and, and the angles of the hip and the stifle and how the, all that, the gaskin and the length of the hind cannon and even the angles of the fetlocks and the feet, there's all uh, a rhyme and a reason to it. Um, I've used the analogy over the decades that horses are like constellations. If you look in the sky and you see the Little Dipper and the Big Dipper, um, if you move one star, you can't see it anymore. It's not there. And so I believe thoroughbreds have points of reference. And then some are Little Dippers and some are Big Dippers and some are in between. And route horses, turf horses, um, sprinters, um, there's all different types that are successful and um, you got to go with what, what works for you. And for me, I, I like horses that's made a certain way. I have a pattern and um, I'm sure Gail and Terry and others have patterns. It's a, um, it, to me, it's very instinctual. Yeah, fantastic. Okay, Gary? next question. Yeah, next question. How much weight do you put uh, on the stallion side of the pedigree when you're considering a yearling or a two-year-old at the sales? 
how about Gail? Gail, what do you think? Well, it, there's the stallion, it, it, it factors in two ways. How much the horse is going to cost and is it a stallion that you like and you've had good luck with? So if you go and pick the most expensive stallions and you're going to come away from that sale with, with nothing. So you have to find horses that fit in your price range that still can do the job that you're looking for that could be successful. But I steer people away from buying horses by uh, let's say a top stallion, but there's no female pedigree. You have to have something on the female side too. So genetically, they're technically 50-50. So I think you have to balance that with, with your price range. That's really the key. Okay. Well, here's a question about uh, what's a reasonable amount of time from purchasing the two-year-old and training at auction until the horse should be ready to race? All right. Um, Terry, you want to shed some light on that one? Well, I think it goes without saying, right? It, it depends on the horse and the, the program that they've come out of. Um, you know, the vast majority of people that are, are, are spending, you know, big dollars at the two-year-old sales are, are, are really looking at their three-year-old year. So the, the balance of their two-year-old year, you know, the, the owners and the trainers and, and, and the uh, connections are trying to figure out how that two-year-old year is going to to fit into a good three-year-old year. So, but, you know, people love to buy two-year-olds and to go to Saratoga and to Del Mar, uh, right? And, and there are plenty of horses that you, you'll see at Saratoga and they'll run a hole in the wind and they'll be the, the talk of the town for the next week. And then the following spring, you never, you know, you don't hear about them. So it's a balance, it's a balance. And it, it, it really depends on the horse and your intentions as a uh, as an operation and as a business. Hey, Mike, can I comment on that just quickly? Yeah, jump in, Doc. Um, I totally agree with everything that Terry said, uh, but it's just, you know, horses will tell you what they should do. And I know that Kenny being a trainer himself has listened and probably reaped the rewards of listening to what horses are telling him. And, and at the end of a two-year-old sale, I don't think that people realize it's a very strenuous process for a horse to go through because they're being asked for a lot, both mentally and physically. And so I think it's very important to assess the horse as an individual, as Terry said, because there's some little tiny things when you buy a horse that you can live with that are gonna be fine if you don't rush the horse. However, if you rush the horse, it might turn out differently. And I think those discussions need to be had on every individual horse. Um, can I just add one thing too? I, I, I try to encourage all my clients that buy two-year-olds in training to turn them out for at least 30 days after Amen. you purchase them. I agree. Uh, and, and sometimes 60 days. And, and, and we've had great luck. We still get them to the races as quickly as the other ones. Two-year-olds are still very young horses and they're growing and they're maturing. And so for everyone that can stand up like, like uh, iron to whatever's thrown at them, most of them can't. And as Terry said, if, you, if you're looking for longevity and horses racing year after year and campaigning, they've got to they, they've be, uh, attention has to be paid to, to things like that, needing the time. I agree with Gail, the, the time after, after the sale. The sale is a useful tool to figure out how fast they are. Mm -hmm. Then a trainer needs to back off and then retrain that horse's mind to learning, like in a case of a horse coming out of two-year-old. So what I want to do is exactly back off at minimum two, three, four weeks, then ease them back into things and then teach them to gallop in company mm -hmm. so that they learn to relax around another horse. And then I actually will take the two-year-old sale horses and make them rate off of another horse because they get a little speed crazy coming out of those auctions sometimes. And if a horse with a bad mind doesn't handle the sale and comes out of the sale nervous, you've got to, you've got to, it's as much their brain as their body. Yeah. Absolutely. So I'll jump in on that. You know, when you go to the two-year-old sales and, and you have the people who are uh, the sellers who are go, 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 you know, and, and you see a well-pedigreed horse and, and a horse you think could be a three-year-old, 
and the consigner, as, as you're going up to try to bid on the horse and the consigner says, you know, I got a gate card for this horse. I would take him to Keeneland and run him four and a half. And you're like, I can't believe you just said that. I can't believe, you know, and the whole dynamic in, in your mind changes. So, um, you know, you're dealing with a different mindset, especially with the two-year-old sellers and, and their outlook on success at the racetrack and early success you know, uh, versus uh, long-term success. Well, Terry, you're, you're, you mentioned your challenges uh, also with an owner when you, as an owner, when you spend a lot of money and, and the, the concept is, oh, we're taking this horse to, to Saratoga to run, maybe yes and maybe no. And that, that, that's the problem is that, that that horse that's intended to go to Saratoga may not be able to be ready for Saratoga. Yeah, well, Doc, expectations are, are certainly, they play a big part in that. And I, I found that partners that own a small piece of a horse, you can manage that uh, dynamic a lot better. I, mm -hmm. I give it to trainers. You know, they have to be uh, pulling their hair out. I'll take a look at Kenny. But over the, over the years, right, they have to be pulling their hair out when they, they bring a group of two-year-olds to Saratoga and to Del Mar. Mm -hmm. and, and the horse isn't quite ready to run. Yeah. And the owner calls and says, uh, I'm bringing my family um, on, the, on the weekend of the 16th of August. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's, it's a tough go for trainers. Obviously, everybody wants to do right by the horse. But it is about performing on the racetrack. So... I give it to trainers with that balancing act. It's got to be tough. Yeah. Okay, Mike, this is Gary. Let, let me jump in here. Um, we're going to continue on here for a few, for a little while longer. For anyone in the audience that needs to jump off, we are recording all of this and, and we'll make this all available to you in a day or so. So uh, I'd like to keep going with some of these questions because I think this is going really well and we still have a lot of people online with us. Okay, so um, here's a question. Do you recommend buying a portion of a more expensive horse that has more potential to be great or 100% with less potential given that we all have budgets? Who wants it? Oh, I'll take that. I always tell people, don't put all your eggs in one basket in, in that <laughs> sense because we know the odds, we already talked about that, 10 in one. So if you have friends, you have a group of friends that you can go and buy five horses together instead of you putting all the money in one horse, you guys will have a lot of fun and you'll probably have a lot more success. Okay. I have a lot of partners. We, we diversify the risk. Um, I have people that take five 20% shares. Um, we don't like to do less than 20, but sometimes we do. But spreading it out and, and really more than anything, going back to the rule of five, we're trying to find the good horse. And then we can't we can't spend years, you know, handling a horse that doesn't have that has average talent. But you never know what that horse cost is a yearling. Sometimes they're less and sometimes they're more. Yeah. So I, I would just jump in. I, I agree with Kenny and, and uh, Gail. And you know. I th I've seen it. I think we've all seen it time and time again. The, uh, the worst thing and the worst situation that you could be in is in a bad partnership with a group of people that own, uh, that own a good horse. Um, and, and so that's a tough go. So, it, you know, really, I think the crux of that is it depends on the people that you would have the other, other 60 or 70 or 80 percent that you would go in with. Yeah, and I'll just say this too, from an owner's perspective, I've been lucky enough to be involved very fractionally with four different horses. Uh, and the feeling you get winning a horse race, no matter how much you own of that horse, it, the joke is that you only own a little piece of the tail. It doesn't matter. That that thrill is the same whether you own a fraction or you own the entire thoroughbred. It's, it's yeah. amazing. So um, I would certainly recommend doing it that way too. Gary? Okay, a couple more questions. Are heart scores used at all in evaluating young horses? Hmm, Doc? Well, well, they are, uh, but it's really not my area. I, I, uh, knowing, uh, well, Terry, Gail, or Kenny might be able to give a better answer, but okay. I think, Terry, I think you, you employ that regularly, so maybe you'd like to speak about that. We sure do, and I, we, we look at it, or we, we take it as a negative indicator, 
So uh, the vast majority of, of, of horses at sales, right, they have a, a heart that's passable. Every once in a while, you'll, you'll see a big framed horse, right, that's got a Maserati frame and, and they've got a Volkswagen heart. And so they're the ones that we invest the money uh, and, and other resources uh, to identify. I think in that respect, right, it's not going to identify the, the derby winner, but it is going to identify the big, strong horse that's not going to want to run past five-eighths of a mile. I don't typically use the heart, heart scans. Um, it's, if, if I have a client that requests it, yes, but it's not something. Logistically, we don't have enough time at the yearling sale. But by the time we're, we're uh, not only shortlisting the horses, we get the repository with our vets like Dr. Burke doing the work. Um, it's hard to fit all that in. We like the gene test. And I, if I can pull a gene test, if I can eliminate a horse that's what we call a router too, I'll do that, but no, no heart scan. Yeah, I don't use the heart scans either. I, I have spent a lot of time talking to Norm Rantanen about it. And he was one of the people that uh, initially pioneered the whole thing. So, but I think the way Terry's using is probably a good tool. All right. Okay, last question, Mike. Um, could Dr. Burke please explain the definition of high, medium, low risk from a throat examination? Sure. Um, uh, I, well, uh, you know, we've mentioned probably the best illustration of any horse that had a questionable throat, and that, that was awesome, Jim, that Terry was talking about, which is asymmetry. Um, I would say w w there's a condition where the left side of the throat just does not work as well as the right side. 90% of the time when you're looking at throat asymmetry, it's the left side. And if you have a horse that is not moving that left side very well, that, that puts a horse in a high risk category because it can't breathe uh, effectively. Um, as far as bone issues, um, I showed you uh, it's a good example of each. That little chip uh, that I showed you off of an ankle, the front of an ankle, is a very low risk item, extremely low risk. Uh, it can be fixed with surgery if necessary. And uh, the likelihood is that the horse is 100% after surgery. The other thing that I showed you, which was the stifle, that is at least a moderate risk thing because uh, if it goes the wrong way, it can become a disaster and maybe can't be fixed. So uh, it's essentially, there's no, um, I mean, we're trying to use science to make those categories of low, medium and high risk a little bit more precise, but there are so many different aspects to a horse that it's just hard to say, well, this is going to affect any given horse in a particular way. So it's based on experience. It's based on the research that we have available to us. And also we have colleagues. Uh, it wouldn't be unusual for me to call a surgeon if I'm looking at a bone problem and just say, hey, what's been your experience with this uh, on an odd case? So um, I, I hope that clarifies it. Um, it can be risk regarding the throat, the bones. Um, I mean, I had one client say, hey, I'm in a low risk category every time I wake up and put my feet out of bed. So, um, you know, there's uh, it, the, the real key there is to understand your client to know what their risk tolerance is so that you can help them. They don't need to understand every nuance of veterinary medicine. They just need to understand that you're matching them up with what's appropriate for them. All right, well, at the beginning of the panel conversation, I told folks that we were going to cover a lot of ground on today's panel discussion. I think mission accomplished. I wanna thank each of you for taking time to be with us. Uh, this was fantastic, I really enjoyed it. I hope that our audience enjoyed it too. Great insight, very helpful, and I'm sure people were able to take some things away from this that will help them moving forward. I wanna thank all the sponsors who helped make this, make this possible, including the New York Racing Association who sponsored this entire panel today. Uh, but most of all, I wanna thank each and every owner out there and each of you who was with us today, you are undoubtedly the backbone of this sport. We don't have a sport without owners and we really do appreciate you being with us and uh, wanna wish everybody uh, a very safe and healthy next several weeks before we get back here with the next owner view panel, which is partnerships and racing syndicates. And we hope you'll all be able to join us for that one coming up on May 4th. In the meantime, enjoy the first leg of the Triple Crown, the Run for the Roses, the Kentucky Derby on Saturday, May 1st. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.
Thanks very much for having us.